today on Call Out, Penticton Search and Rescue teams up with Princeton SAR to look for a missing woman. If you guys can take the river's edge, okay. you guys can sweep the banks with our guys. And later, SAR teams apply lost person psychology to hone in on their missing subjects. For people with dementia, we often say they go until they get stuck. Sunday, 4.41 p.m., the Penticton Swiftwater Rescue Team is en route to assist Princeton SAR in a mutual aid call-out. Earlier that day, an elderly woman traveling by bus from Vancouver to Penticton was reported missing when she did not arrive at her scheduled destination. Her bag arrived, but she did not. When her bags arrived in Penticton and she didn't, the person there to pick her up called a family member to confirm that she was indeed on the bus. Knowing that, the RCMP were called to report her missing. The family verified she had boarded the bus wearing a blue jacket and white running shoes. The remaining passengers and driver were then interviewed by the RCMP with immediate results. A woman came forward and said that she had indeed gotten off the bus in Princeton and not gotten back on. Princeton, a scheduled rest stop before Penticton, is a small, relatively quiet town of about 3,000 residents. Like many communities in the area, the economy here has been a little slow lately. Things have picked up, though, with the reopening of a local copper mine. However, with so many new people in town, the missing woman might not be as easy for the RCMP to spot. But as it turns out, she's no stranger to Princeton after all. She used to live in the trailer park across the river from the bus depot and could have walked over the bridge for a visit. It is a bit of a hike, but she could have done it. She was supposed to be in pretty good shape. It's worth a look. Any chance you've seen her today? No, I haven't. Okay. Coming in because we're looking for a missing female. She Interviews with store employees at the mall located right next to the bus stop provide no further clues to the woman's whereabouts. Thank you. One last look through town, and it's time for the RCMP to step it up. They alert Princeton Search and Rescue, who set up their command post at the bus depot and begin operations. Being that we're a small team, we have to call for mutual aid. So in this case, we called Ben Tickton Sar, Karamia Sar, and Oliver Suez Sar. Randy also calls for the South Okanagan Regional Swiftwater Team, who are now halfway to Princeton and in the middle of an early spring hailstorm. Penticton's ground SAR team is also en route and updates Swiftwater team leader Hamish Reedy on the situation. The other thing we had was uh, he had some uh, previous residents on the other side of the river. Yeah, that's uh, fair enough, Cindy. We'll take a detailed flight up that river. The Similkameen is in high flow and lies directly between the town and the trailer park. If the subject went down to the river on her way over to visit, there's a distinct possibility she's been swept in. With four SAR teams en route by ground and a swift water team in the air, Princeton starts combing the streets and interviewing residents. Within minutes, two locals report seeing a woman matching the description sitting on the bench right near the bus depot. Randy sends a tracking team over to see if a direction of travel can be determined from the bench through the grassy area. No luck. Team members go door to door with a photo of the woman, hoping she's there visiting. Perhaps the occupants have seen her in town or passing by their homes. The searchers check both seniors' homes and talk with residents there. Unfortunately, with old age comes that some people had had tea with her that morning, but we discounted that. However, they did pick up another lead. Some of the people knew her, which was good, because they mentioned that her husband was buried in the local cemetery, so on the off chance that maybe she went up to see his gravesite, we sent a team up to sweep the roads up to there and through the graveyard. All quiet. Can you give us a report? Back in town, locals monitoring the VHF radio channel have heard the report and are keeping a sharp eye out as well. 
Then, another sighting. A retail clerk confirms that an elderly woman matching the description came into her store and purchased a lottery ticket. Thank you. She was really tiny um, build, and she was hunched over a little bit. I know she was wearing a blue jacket. I'd never seen her before. Uh... She recognized the description, gave us a direction of travel. She was adamant that she had seen this woman. The direction of travel continues to point towards the river. With nearly 50 SAR members about to launch a full-scale search along with the RCMP, and many townspeople on the lookout as well, how long could it possibly take to find the missing woman? 5.15 p.m. Out-of-town SAR teams marshal at the Princeton Command Center in preparation for the search. The airborne Swiftwater rescue team has also arrived and does a hasty search before landing. We've just arrived in the Princeton Valley here. We're uh, just running up the river to our point last team bound to the heli site there. Uh, With no immediate sign of the woman on either riverbank, they fly directly over her former residence at the trailer park and land. Princeton Ground Search and Rescue may be a smaller team, but when we arrived as mutual aid, they were on their game. Randy, Randy, how are you, sir? So where did she, where's the bus station and where'd she go? Where you guys, where we're staged? Yeah. That's the bus station. Okay. Search manager Randy Rorvik has been with the Princeton Search and Rescue team for several years now, but this is by far his biggest call out. Princeton simply does not get the call volume that teams like Penticton experience. It's really good to see Penticton and Oliver Sias Caramia show up because very experienced people with their teams. We've got uh, 11 from Caramias, five of us. Just going to do a kind of quick, hasty search <laughs> okay. down through here. If you guys can take the river's edge. Okay. You have other SAR managers coming in, not there to take over Randy's job, but to provide him with resources of knowledge and experience to help him do his job. Randy's day job, his paid profession, is work as a land surveyor. He's lived in Princeton most of his life and drops everything when there's a call out. It's nice to see 47 people show up on a Sunday evening to do this, because we know it's when it's, it's old or young, bad weather, you gotta, you gotta do it fast. Hamish and his Swiftwater team lift off for another look at the river. We didn't spot her on shore, but we did notice an item of interest, a blue object in a pool of water on a sandbar. The object looks larger than a jacket or a body and is located near the convergence of the two rivers by the Princeton campground. We decided we would look at it on our shoreline search from Princeton down past the object. In the meantime, a team member is sent out with a quad to search the pathway and campground across from the sandbar. No items of clothing or signs of the subject are spotted. A dog team is also sent in to comb the bog area along the shore between the river and the bus depot, with similar results. The Swiftwater team regroups at the command center to prepare for the shoreline search. Basically what you guys are going to do um, is you're going to stay up on flat land here. Hamish briefs the ground SAR members supporting the Swiftwater team. Safety is always number one. We were still hoping to find a live subject, but the odds were we were going to be looking for a body. The Similkameen is in full flow, and this does not help the search. As the water comes up, objects that normally would entrap a body or hold it tend to flush. However, even in relatively smooth looking water, things can be hung up just below the surface. But if we find an item of interest that's safe to get at and look at, we'll enter the water if it's safe to do so. If we can conduct a swift water search and never get in the water, that's the best way to go about it. The team nears the confluence of the two rivers before it's too dark to continue. We finished task one of our swift water search here. Our light's fading fast. We're gonna contact command, see what they want done, whether or not we continue downriver. All depends. 
If you guys feel that this is safely, you can do it. With this team. They regroup at the command center and debate checking out the blue object spotted earlier by helicopter further downriver. Right now, it's the best lead they have. It's all dike on the... So, I guess, uh, Randy, all of the night we're going to be able to do command over. As the Swiftwater team strategizes over the next move, Randy pours over his notes. He's confident that they should have found the subject by now if she's still in the Princeton area. As the discussion continues, Randy gets a call. It's good news. She got off the bus in Hope. Got back onto the wrong bus, ended up in Salmon Arm. Somehow got back to Penticton. Friends of a friend's called and found out she was at home. So they just phoned us and said she's at home and it's a happy ending. A happy ending, but it's a bit odd. Three witnesses had seen the woman downtown. A lot of white haired ladies that live in Princeton. Being a search manager, I've learned over the years that every witness that you talk to, you have to take with a grain of salt. Sometimes interviewing a person twice or three times will get you a different story each time, but some facts always come out the same. One fact is for sure, this call out came at a price. 47 volunteers time on a weekend and a great deal of hardware and expense. People just don't realize the kind of manpower that's put in to a search and rescue operation. Nonetheless, Princeton SAR manager Randy Rorvik in particular is happy that the subject is safe at home and even finds a bit of humor in the situation. She's sitting on a bus and she has no idea that 47 people are back in Princeton looking for her. Now, SAR teams apply lost person psychology to hone in on their missing subjects. For people with dementia, we often say they go until they get stuck. Saturday, 2.30 p.m. A young boy on a family camping trip goes for a short walk in the woods, promising to return in 30 minutes. When he fails to show up after two hours, his worried parents call 911. 5.30 p.m. Ground search and rescue crews arrive on scene and gather as much information as they can. Okay. How old is the boy? What kind of gear is he carrying? How long ago did he leave? The information allows search managers to match him to a specific subject profile and better predict where he may have gone. One of the first things we do at the very beginning of a search is assign that missing person to a subject category. Robert Kester is a leading expert on lost person behavior with extensive experience in search and rescue. Using data from thousands of past incidents, he has identified 41 different subject categories. These profiles take into account a number of factors, such as type of activity, mode of transportation, mental health, and age. For each of the, the subject categories, they have their own set of statistics. Probably one of the most common one would be what I call the ring model. How far away from the place they were last seen do you typically find them as the crow flies? Every category is assigned to speed. For example, someone traveling on an ATV will travel faster than someone on foot. A skier will cover more distance than a snowshoer, but a snowshoer with a pack will travel less distance than a snowshoer without a load. Using speed tables and ring models, search managers are able to quickly determine that the missing boy, age nine, with a maximum walking speed of three kilometers per hour and now missing for three hours, will not have traveled more than nine kilometers from the campsite. They also know that over 90% of the time, children his age are found within 3.5 kilometers of their point last seen. That gives you a sort of how big your search area has to be. We have another statistic. What type of location are they actually likely to be found in? 
Each subject category is known to seek or follow specific features when lost. Autistic children tend to try to find a structure or a building or a small tight place to get into, or they may be attracted to water. For people with dementia, we often say they go until they get stuck. Visually, they tend to just move straight ahead until they hit some type of feature. It could be a fence, it could be thick foliage. It could also, once again, actually be water, and we see a lot of drowning cases. Healthy children, such as our missing nine-year-old, are known to use paths of least resistance. They typically avoid thick brush and uphill slopes in favor of existing trails and flat terrain. Within hours, and using lost person behavior theory, the SAR managers successfully direct the search teams to where the missing boy has finally stopped next to a large tree. He had wisely decided to stay put and make himself visible which is the number one rule of the Hug a Tree and Survive program advocated by search and rescue organizations. Being lost in the wilderness can be terrifying. When I was alone, it was just so isolating, so alienated and so traumatic. And you go through such basic primal fear and emotional distress. I was afraid and I was worrying that there might be some dangerous animals in the woods, like bears or cougars. Emotional duress can cause people to ignore their better judgment and attempt regaining orientation at all cost. Ça commence à être très dangereux quand je montais. Mais je me suis dit, je vais, je vais juste grimper en montagne et essayer de voir quelque chose, de, de voir est-ce que je m'en vais. Their mind is being dumped with adrenaline, and they're not able to think straight in the beginning. So the first thing is just stop. Then think about your, your, your situation. Okay, let's go up. Okay. Up we go. Lead on. Emotions play less of a role when a person isn't alone. We were never worried. We were all, you know what? It was another adventure. We all kind of had a little chuckle about it. We were all, you know, we, we knew our situation. And we were fine. Denial, on the other hand, had a strong impact on this group's behavior. When they came upon a large lake that was not on their intended route, they should have clued in that they were nowhere near where they thought they were. It's getting late in the afternoon, guys. I want to go up. I don't know you guys. I was very strongly convinced that I was in Singing Pass. I, I don't know what it would have taken to convince me that I was at Chequemus Lake. I really don't. Let's go up. Okay, up we go. His internal compass was so turned around that he was really in disbelief that uh, this could be Chequemus Lake. And, and, uh, and that's part of survival psychology is you, you, know, you latch onto a, a theory or a belief and that stays with you to the detriment of, of your travel direction. When there are no visual cues, such as on snow-covered mountains or in foggy or white-out conditions, people tend to walk in circles. I didn't know which way would lead where, so I decided to go left when it led left, and then it, you know, trailed me off 15 minutes into a complete circle, winding around and bringing back to where I was. Most lost people will eventually try to latch on to some type of linear feature. A stream, a ridge, a road, a pipeline, a drainage of some sort. And typically we'll start to, to follow that. This is known as route traveling and is common amongst hikers and outdoor enthusiasts with little or no experience. However, it is not a guaranteed way out. We follow one creek down to the woods, but after we were lost, we, t we took the other creek as the first creek that we were following. So actually, it's the main reason that we got lost. Uh, you're most welcome. Wayfinding strategies vary depending on the subject category. Young children and people in a state of panic commonly travel randomly in the hopes of finding something familiar. 
Older children and adolescents sometimes use direction sampling, testing out different paths until they think they found the right one. Adults with maps often employ view enhancement, which consists of gaining elevation either by climbing a tree or a hill in order to survey the land. Others will choose to backtrack, but reversing directions and finding your own tracks requires a high level of experience and outdoor skills. Overconfident hunters or people in denial are known to travel in one particular direction, believing it's the right one and ignoring trails and features indicating otherwise. When you get to a point where you just, you don't know where to go, the best thing to do is just hunker down and hug a tree, we say, and wait. Just to try and dry out, stay warm, and not use up the rest of your energy reserves. Call out search and rescue features, real stories, filmed live by search and rescue teams during actual missions. Find out more at calloutsar.tv.